Hi right, guys. So anyway, we were just getting towards the end of chapter 20, Final Ascent into Hell, where our little microbus was on its final leg back into Cusco, Peru. And uh, so we're just going to do a little repeat of the last paragraph and wrap it up. As darkness descended over our little chariot and my stomach began to churn, the following rant bubbled into my mind like gas from my guts. Here comes three dozen years of bilious ham-bone vitriol born in the basement of a comfortable middle-class home in suburban Atlanta. If you don't want to get hit by this blast of psychic puke that has been bubbling inside of me since I first laid eyes on that famous Taming the Green Hell photo from Life magazine that has dogged me for most of my life, you had better get out of the way because here it comes. Whoever said the road to hell was paved with good intentions obviously never traveled that stretch of planetary wreckage known as the Transoceanic Highway between Puerto Maldonado and Cusco, Peru. If they had, they would have known that at least one particular road to hell is paved with the most craven, evil intentions of any 200-mile stretch of roadway on Earth. Make no mistake about it. This $1.3 billion boulevard of broken forest, the granddaddy of all environmental boondoggles, is being rammed through the heart of arguably the most fragile, biologically rich corner left on the face of Gaia with the sole intention of raping and plundering and profaning the most sacred swath of wilderness we have left, the Amazon rainforest. It is an act of planet gorging, the likes of which the most fanatic doomsday prophet, hey, I resemble that remark, cannot imagine in his darkest nightmares until witnessing the carnage firsthand, as I did in June of 2009. It's worse than I thought, and I thought it was pretty damn bad. <clears throat> Peruvian President Alan Garcia and the Planet Eaters, whose dicks are in his mouth, have launched an assault against Peru that the battered, poverty-stricken country has not witnessed since Pizarro wiped out the Inca culture 500 years ago. Where do you think Garcia and his predecessor, Alejandro Toledo, came up with the mega bucks to finance such an all-out bloodthirsty war against his own land and people from the folks who voted him into office? Yeah, right. The money came from two obvious Chinese and, no doubt, to a little bit lesser extent, American blood money laundering outfits officially known as the Brazilian National Development Bank, who threw in some $400 million into the Peruvian project, and the even more obscure Andean Development Corporation, which tossed in another $200 million or so of loans to the Peruvian government. I don't have the time, the inclination, or frankly the interest to go digging through the mountains of misinformation on the web to confirm my hunches that this money pit is being financed by Asian markets. It's just plain common sense. The yellow brick road to the Pacific Ocean from the heart of Brazil leads straight to China. There is probably a fucking map somewhere on some Planet Eater's wall in Beijing right now showing a bridge all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Of course, the eastern leg of the road, which comprises 80% of its length, 
leads straight to the Atlantic Ocean, then onward to the U.S. and Western Europe. Why do you think the Brazilian Reed Chinese National Development Bank would throw down $400 million of money to build a road across Peru so a few Indians could get their bananas and pineapples to market in Cusco and Lima? Yeah, right. That kind of pile of money is being spent to get all that lumber, beef, gold, minerals, oil of the petrol, soy, and palm varieties, bush meat, jaguar pelts, cocaine, and whatever else they can plunder to markets in China and to a lesser degree India and Southeast Asia as quickly and efficiently as possible. Why else? Oh yeah, and to bring more Brazilian tourists to Machu Picchu. That's why. Please. <clears throat> Do you really think Brazil or China really gives a shit if Peru ever pays back those loans? Peru and those pesky Indians who live there is nothing but a temporary roadblock, more like a log jam in the river that is simply in the way of China's plans to loot Brazil and Brazil's servile rush to bend over, spread them, and let them do it. The billion bucks is just a, is just a cost of doing business that will be an easily recoverable drop in the bucket compared to what Brazil stands to gain from the sell-off of the Amazon to Asia. And Alan Garcia is hiring his own citizens to literally push his own country out of the way, tree by tree, river by river, village by village, mountain by mountain, to make way for the flood of Gaian blood that is going to come pouring through the open drain the day the last ounce of pavement is poured sometime in 2010, Peru and by proxy the United States and the World Bank have had centuries to get off their asses and build a lousy 300 mile road across the Andes and make that out of the Amazon jungle. Brazil finally got off their asses, financed by the United States and the World Bank about 40 years ago and got rewarded the cover of Life magazine as praise for their efforts, it's little surprise that America's interest in the Peruvian end of the road started flagging as the road to hell became more and more modernized along its eastern half. That was the half that pointed our way, so why did we give a shit about Peru? Sure, some little jeep trail was hacked out over the Peruvian Andes Mountains and through the woods to Grandma's house in Puerto Maldonado, but just four years ago, it took a week to make the 200-mile trip that takes 18 hours today and will take six or seven hours when the road is finished and paved a few years from now. China simply got fed up with waiting around for someone else to build the damn road and finally said, screw this shit, we'll build the damn road ourselves. And that is exactly what they have been doing for the past four years smashing ahead with the single biggest environmental disaster this side of their own Three Gorges Dam, all with the Peruvian government cheering them on and rolling out the red carpet for the Planet Eaters. And who the hell is going to stop them? A bunch of Peruvian tree huggers? Yeah, right! A rising tide of mostly American and Western European environmentalists have been waving red flags and more recently white flags <clears throat> for years, but nobody <clears throat> has been listening, not in Peru anyway, 
no doubt there are a few, very few, Chinese environmentalists waving red flags of their own if they've ever even heard of the road with all the censorship in China, but their hands are more than full with saving pandas and fighting Three Gorges Dam. There's been about as much environmental oversight guarding Gaia against this planet-eating gluttony as the Incas had over the conquistadors five centuries ago, or the Brazilian natives had over the rubber barons last century. The monkeys are still running the zoo like they always have been, and there is nobody around to stop them or hardly even notice which is exactly the way the planet-eating apes from Peru to Brazil to the U.S. to China want it. And, like everything else they want, they get. I have read somewhere that the section of road just east of this one, the one that is ravaging the rainforest of southwest Brazil the same way this stretch is ravening the rainforest of southeast Peru has been named by some brilliant planet-eating PR flack the Chico Mendez Parkway. To have the straight-faced and bold-faced gall to insult and profane the name and legacy of Chico Mendez who spent and ultimately gave his life to battling this very road from hell when he was gunned down in cold blood in his own home by the Planet Eaters, a mile or so from the parkway that now carries his name would be tantamount to naming a new brand of shotgun after Martin Luther King Jr. The very thought of such a ghoulish flash of PR panache and planet-eating doublespeak tickles the deepest core of my own macabre appreciation of the darkly ironic and absurd. It's just one more glorious example of the Planet Eater's capacity to rub salt into Mother Nature's wounds, to mock and taunt those of us who are on to their evil little game and crow into our faces we're not going to stop this plunder of the temple until there is nothing left, and there's not a fucking thing you can do about it. What the hell ever happened to that biblical prophecy about the meek inheriting the earth anyway? By the time that happens, the only earth left to inherit will be a bunch of scorched jungle, mountains of slag, and bottomless pits of chemical poison where a perfectly good planet once stood. If you want a perfect illustration of what the highway from hell will mean to what's left of the Amazon rainforest, here is all you need to do. Fill up your kitchen sink with water with the drain plug firmly installed. The water in your full sink was the Amazon rainforest before the first planet eaters hit the scene five centuries ago. To be brutally honest and accurate, you would need to dip out about a cup or two of water to account for the planet eating actions of the Asiatic natives between 20,000 and 500 years ago. Now, replace that iron-tight drain plug with something like a tightly wadded wash rag or plastic bag. The water remaining in your sink is, in a half hour or so, is what's left of the Amazon today after 500 years of plunder by the Brazilians, the Europeans, and the Americans which include you and me, just in case you've lost sight of the fact that this plunder has been fueled by gringo consumers who are ultimately to blame for the evil Planet Eater's actions. Okay, now pull the plug out of the drain and watch how fast the water swirls out of your sink and into the sewer. That is exactly what is going to happen to the remaining Amazon rainforest when the Chinese government 
pulls the plug out of the Peruvian Amazon by paving this last little stretch of highway. Mark my words, amigos. All right, back to the story. Perhaps it was all these depressing thoughts of drain plugs and empty sinks and sewers, or maybe it was just that bad bowl of mutton soup from the last town, I don't know, that started my own guts to rumbling as we barreled on through the gathering darkness, which at least mercifully erased the brutal sight of the ravaged mountain pass we were passing through. Still three hours away from Cusco, it began to occur to me with a sinking, rising feeling of horror that I was getting ready to endure perhaps the most dreaded fear of third world travelers, to be barreling across Peru in a bus with no bathroom, with Montezuma, or should I say in this case, Atahualpa, seeking his revenge against your ancestors by attacking your guts. This fear has gripped me for half my life as half my life. As much as I dreaded it, it's no wonder the universe finally reacted to this negative law of attraction and sent my way my worst fear, diarrhea on a third world bus. I tried in vain to think of all the non-diarrhea subjects on Earth I could imagine to put my mind and my squirming colon at ease. I contorted my body into more positions than Jane Fonda in an aerobic exercise video to convince this pool of muck in my guts to ooze back up toward my pancreas and away from the seat of my pants. With each hairpin turn, the liquid in my gut sloshed around, building up more pressure than the logging trucks piling up behind the asphalt trucks on the highway to hell. Sweat began popping out on my forehead like the stars popping out in the Andean sky above me. A half hour ticked on by as my discomfort mounted. Finally, I surrendered to my fate. When you gotta go, you gotta go. I whispered to the kind-hearted planet eater beside me to please ask the nice driver to stop for a bathroom break. I couldn't, sorry, give a shit whether it was at a gas station or a grove of trees. We were approaching an emergency that not even President Alan Garcia could fix with a helicopter full of hired assassins. My new friend passed on the message. I could clearly hear him mention the words gas station or trees. So what do you think the nice driver did in the middle of a town, he pulled over into a vacant lot on the side of the highway and announced we were taking a short pit stop. The seven men on the little bus piled out into the street, leaving the two women to their own evacuatory fates. As six of the men lined up along the bus to do their business on the town's roadside, I trundled across the vacant lot in virtual darkness, I scaled a low brick wall, losing my glasses in the process, which fortunately landed me in yet another more private vacant lot for me to do my business. I'll spare you the gory details. Let's just say I managed to blow out of my backside my feelings toward the planet eaters that had led me down such a trail of existential despair. I hadn't been back on the bus five minutes before the ghost of Atahualpa began spearing me in the guts again. Once more I contorted myself into Houdini. Miraculously, I managed to make it to Cusco into a cab up the hill and to my hotel with my bag of cannonballs. 
I was at code orange status when the proprietress of the hotel came to my rescue. She had good news and bad news for me. The good news was that there was a vacancy. The bad news was that there were no rooms left with private bathrooms. I managed to make it into my room just long enough to dump my bag of cannonballs and raced across the courtyard to the decidedly non-private shared bathroom where everyone in the hotel got to enjoy the explosive sound effects of yours truly sending out his message to the Planet Eaters in language even they could understand. I staggered back to my room and collapsed into bed with the bubblegum taste of Pepto-Bismol lingering in my mouth. I drifted off to a fitful night's sleep to recover and reflect upon my first adventure into the Peruvian Amazon. What a way to close part one of my Peruvian plunge. And that will wrap up part chapter 20 and part 1 and bring us to our Cusco interlude coming right up. Bye, guys.